looks like we've got a nice group. I'm sure more will join. Um, but in order to not deprive anyone of uh, any of Justin's presentation, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Justin Colonino. Justin is a senior attorney on the open source team at Microsoft. Justin and I go way back. We uh, we started our, our careers as open source attorneys in the same place, the Software Freedom Law Center, a nonprofit that represents uh, open source community projects. Um, and Justin has fired like a rocket since then um, and is now is now uh, telling the Microsoft uh, rank and file how it's done. Uh, Justin, I really appreciate your being here today and sharing your experience. I know that the topic, uh, how you do open source uh, advising at scale is going to be very interesting to everyone in attendance and I'm looking forward to it myself. Thanks, Aaron. It's great to be working with you again. As Aaron mentioned, we we go back to probably 2008, 2009 timeframe, um, and then you know we're colleagues at the Software Freedom Law Center. So it's always great to um, to work with you. Um, yeah, open source advising at scale is something that uh, is 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 fascinating to me, um, partially because you know when I when I found out the the job at Microsoft. Um, and Microsoft was looking for an open source lawyer. This was, you know, three or four years ago. And, you know, my first instinct was, you know, yeah, right, Microsoft. Like, you're not an open source company. Uh, you know, what, what, are we, what are we talking about here? And, um, you know, I, I went there and I met the people and I found out, whoa, whoa, they're actually really trying to become an open source company. And um, over the last three or four years, we've really gone through a phase transition in enabling engagement with open source from, you know, a policy a few years ago, um, you know, as kind of you might you might guess from the relationship in the in the aughts between the open source community and Microsoft from a kind of just say no type policy to a, you know, say, you know, say yes unless otherwise um, unless there's some real issues type of policy. And so, uh, you know. I've gone. It's gone from, you know, a just say no to advising sixty thousand developers about how to engage with open source responsibly, kind of on a daily basis. And so, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we think about that process at Microsoft, or how I think about that process in my, at Microsoft, and how to. Um, and if Microsoft can do it, you can. You can too. So let me share my screen, and we'll get uh, ready to to go into the the presentation. Can folks see that okay? Yep, looks good. Excellent. So, you know, of course, a little disclaimer, you know, I, I, I am here uh, as Justin, not as Microsoft, um, but, you know, I'm here to help share what I've learned as an attorney at Microsoft, kind of putting the puzzle pieces together on on how to do this at, at, at massive, massive scale. So let's... We're going to talk uh, in three three basic topics, and you know the first is kind of just a quick refresher around what open source is and what we care about as people setting up a compliance program for for license compliance on the inbound side um, with with open source licenses, and that and that also kind of bleeds over to the outbound side a little bit as well. So basically, you know, what is open source and, and what are the different types of licenses that you'll see in an open source space? Second, I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive into, I, I think, what a, basically what a critical area is in open source law, which is what is the definition of a derivative work under U.S. copyright law? And what does that mean for some of the open source licenses? I'm going to talk a little bit about how, because there's so little case law in the open source environment, you need to make tough calls sometimes. And there isn't a lot of basis for making the call. And you just need to kind of do the best you can. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I apply those principles, you know, what is open source and, and legal definitions as I think about you know, how to advise people across, you know, 60,000 developers, millions of use cases on a, on a you know, monthly or yearly basis. So I, I like to start here, um, which is to say that anybody can learn kind of the technical and legal underpinnings of, of open source licenses. Open, there's only about 35 open source licenses that I see on a 
regular basis. I'd say that there's a long tail that stretches down to around 200 or so that come across my desk on a on like a quarterly basis. And so, and a lot of them are, you know, frankly, poorly written. They were written by um, developers or, you know, have a lot of ambiguity in them. And the legal and technical application of, of kind of, um, I'd, I'd call it kind of chopping wood type mentality or, or, or grunt work and it kind of applying what those mean sometimes goes ab- above the legal and technical and into the, you know, social, political, and economic. You know, who are the people that put this under this license so that they'd be giving it away um, for people to use, modify, and redistribute? Um, why did they do that? What are their goals? Um, is important for um, understanding what ha- both how to interpret the licenses and how you might you know resolve disputes if they if they come down the road for you. So using all of these tools and understanding those motivations, both from an economic, political, and social perspective, is extremely important as you engage um, in this space. And applying that to counseling is um, also important. So looking at, uh, this is kind of how I like to think about counseling at scale, right? On the, on the one hand, you have the, on the right-hand side of the graph, you have custom. That's really hard to scale, anything that's custom, really, really hard to scale. Um, and on the left, you have commodity, which is something that you can tool. You can have, you know, a, a docs page inside your organization that describes to people what exactly they have to do. Um, and that 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 can scale. And so it's very easy kind of on the if you're doing kind of a rote legal technical application to be down on the left hand side. It's a little bit harder in the social, political, economic space um, to, to move stuff from custom down to commodity. But what you should be thinking about at all times is once you've made a custom call a few times, are there principles that you can take out of those and push those down into the economic, I'm sorry, push those down into the commodity, um, the commodity space. Another, another kind of line that I've drawn here is between the legal and technical and the social, political, economic. Um, I think a good way to think about this is in legal and technical, there are a lot of um, bright line rules, which means you know you can basically say like yes or no very easily. It's really easy to bucket sort those issues. Whereas um, in, in in law, we like to call you know multi factor tests or mushy standards um, are the guideposts of the social, political, economic things. It's just a, it's kind of the guidance you give is more along the lines of, well, you know, here are the factors that you need to be considering and here are the principles by which our organization stands. Um, and so therefore my advice is X and you can and it, you can scale that by codifying those principles so that others can make them within the organization and be kind of true to the guiding light. And that's easier to do um, to make that commodity advice in the economic, political, social with those guideposts or mushy standards than it is with bright line rules because um, there aren't a lot of bright line rules in those um, in those types of scenarios. So that said, let's move to kind of the the crucial question in open uh, or one of the crucial questions. You know, what is open source? Open source is just a it's a it's a set of software that's under a license, which begs the question. You know, what is a license? So does anyone want to um, you know ga- you know bravely unmute and and venture an answer to this question? You thought you'd just be on mute the whole time and do some other work at the same time as hearing my presentation. Anybody? It's basically terms under which you can use the software. Right. Thank you. Um, I didn't. I didn't catch you said that, but thank you for for venturing a, an answer. Um, I actually, I'd actually say it's a little bit simpler than that, or you know, it, it's actually just kind of permission. Right. And so a license doesn't need to have terms attached to it at all. It can just say you can if you say to somebody, hey, like, go ahead and take this and and do something with it. That's essentially a license. Right. It's just the permission. And and that would be, you know, um, to, to the to the speaker's point, the terms and conditions there would be, you know, there are none. Just just go ahead and do it. Um, so, I, you know, I'd qualify it to, to get more in line with what the um, you know, what the 
answer or speaker just said, which is, you know, permission sub, usually subject to conditions or obligations. Now, this is different than a than a contract because a contract requires um, an agreement between two people or, you know, in, in or at least in U.S. law, a meeting of the minds. Um, a license is just permission and then sets out the meets and bounds around what which that permission is granted. So, you know, you think of a driver's license, that license is issued by the state and the terms and conditions are, you know, don't speed or too much and, you know, don't drink and drive um, or, or your license will be revoked. Similarly, um, open source licenses or licenses generally say, you know, here are the ways that you're, this is what you can do and here are the uh, things that would will lead to termination of your license, either termination through notice or automatic termination. So really, it's just kind of um, you know a simple bargain. If we distill down what you know open source licenses are in terms of both the conditions and the I'm sorry the permissions and the conditions or obligations, um, it's essentially you know the right to you know the four freedoms from the Free Software Foundation, which is the right to use, copy, modify, and redistribute your modifications um, to to anyone. Um, but you need to meet the conditions or obligations. And there, there are a lot of licenses, but you can basically put the obligations into two buckets, um, which are, you know, number one, provide notice. This is if you're using the software. Now, if you're kind of contributing or kind of modifying it uh, online or, you know, um, doing some kind of uh, open source project, there are some other considerations here. But on the using side, you typically just need to provide notice that you're using the the um, the component, and sometimes provide uh, source code along with it. And so, taking that as um, as kind of our our foundational practice, we can kind of skip through the license archetypes, which basically there are, there are five buckets. They're the ultra permissive licenses going down all the way to network copyleft, and they're increasing obligations that go along with each one of these um, these types of 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 licenses. And so, let me just quickly walk through some examples um, of of these types of licenses, and and I'm I'm gonna and also touch briefly on what copyleft means for those of us who who haven't gotten there because it's going to ma matter down the road. So ultra permissive licenses, the goal of people who put stuff under ultra permissive licenses is that it's maximum rights, um, no obligations. And I'd invite people to look up um, a license called the WTFPL, which I don't recommend anybody uses, um, but it's the what the F public license. And it's really a parity license of, of um, the GPL, but the terms and conditions for uh, modifying use and redistribute is you do, just do what you want to. Um, it's a little bit more colorful than that, but th that really is what it says. And so the goal of that license is, look, I'm giving you all the rights you need. You don't need to do anything. And so that's an ultra ultra permissive license. Uh, there are some others in that um, in that space, the unlicensed or the Creative Commons Zero license. All don't have. You don't need to do anything in order to take advantage of the permissions um, that relate to the license. Um, permissive license is also very widely used, easy to use, or or semi easy to use, which we'll get to in a second. Um, the goal there is to give you maximum rights with minimum obligations. And the minimum obligations is this attribution obligation, which is that you provide the copyright statement of the author typically, and um, you pass along the license information along with the license. Um, there's an interesting discussion going on in a, on a open source lawyer mailing list right now about, um, about some of the terms that go along with permissive licenses. Um, namely, the permissive license basically just says you can do what you want with the software in, in object or, or source code form. Um, but, you know, and then it has this huge warranty disclaimer in all caps. And that um, attribution obligation that passes along the license, I believe, is an attempt by the drafters. This goes back to the 80s, so, you know, when I was a kid. But um, I believe goes back to the purpose of let's pass along those um, warranty and, and and disclaimers so that the original author can't be held liable for what some person does with the software down the road because it's kind of unforeseeable what someone could do given these kind of broad obligations that are that are um, going along. 
So now we get to the copyleft licenses, um, which all have source availability obligations that run along with them of, of various flavors. Um, now, the idea of copyleft is that copyleft is essentially a hack on copyright law. It says you can use this software and you know modify it, uh, redistribute it, you know however you want to. But when you redistribute this software, you need to give people the same ability to interact with and learn how the software operates by providing source code to them. And so that's a that is a condition of using the license. So you know, not doing that amounts, you know, in the in the drafter's view, amounts to copyright infringement. And so it 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 the idea is that it creates a snowball effect um, that runs along with the software to improve functionality in that in that program or, or set of programs. Um, weak copyleft has a very bright line as to what um, you know what the source availability obligations are. So if you're working in a with a software library, and software libraries are basically a set of core functionality, you could imagine a library around cryptography or or something a little simpler, sorting various ways of sorting lists, right? That that library instead of every time you need to sort a list, you write a new uh, function that sorts lists for you. Uh, a library is something you can reuse that can take various sorts of various types of lists and sort them in various ways, you know, alphabetical, numerical, um, you know, what have you. And so, a goal when people apply a weak copyleft license to to that sort of functionality, the goal is typically to preserve freedom or the ability to kind of use, modify, and redistribute that software in source form in that core set of functionality. So, if I take that sorting uh, algorithm and, I, and there's a new use case for it, and I, so I tweak it slightly, when I distribute it to others, they can get the benefit of my tweaks uh, or their their. I'm obligated to give them the benefits of my my tweaks under under the license, and that's the that's the point there. So the, the idea is to have this kind of bright line around around that. In LGPL, that's um, kind of around um, linking, which is a way of of calling functionality in a um, in a programmatic way. MPL is the Mozilla Public License. That is basically, you know, if you're using source under the MPL in a file, you need to produce um, that source file um, as part of your source disclosure obligations. The EPL is a little trickier. You'll see I put a, a question mark under there. It, it runs to, it's heavily used in the Java space. So it's basically around um, or thought to run around um, uh jar files which are java archive files that um that are different modules of software that get shipped around in the java ecosystem um, but i put a question mark there because uh, i'm going to get to that in a little bit um copyleft um the distribution is exactly like we copyleft except the there's no or less of a bright line the distribution triggers uh, source code obligations for all derivative works of the program and the question of what derivative work is, is one that um, is highly unknown. Uh, and, I, and I hate to tell clients this, but um, if a lawyer says like, yeah, the bound, I'm very clear on what the boundary between derivative works and not in software is in the United States, at least, um, they're, I don't think they, I don't. I don't think they're right <laughs> because you know I think it's highly unknown what a court's actually going to do because it, it's never really been litigated and there's not a lot of case law that's directly on point. Um, and then finally, network copyleft. The the goal there is um, to extend copyleft for for kind of cloud services. So if you're interacting with the program over a network, um, there's a source code obligation that that runs along with it. That's the same extent as the um, the 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 derivative works obligations under copyleft it's just that the the triggering act for the obligation um occurs on interaction over a network which is also kind of hard to hard, hard to grok under the the license so there's a little bit of ambiguity there but it occurs on network interaction rather than um actual distribution of the binary bits or or source code bits to a third party so that was a bit of a that was a bit of a, a long-winded um, introduction to uh, open source uh, license archetypes. I want to pause there to make sure that there are no questions before I move on to the next, um, you know, the next slides. Hey Justin, great, it's Anthony. Uh, quick question: For the term distribution triggers, just to be clear, what does distribution um, mean to you? 
Um, well, so distribution um, essentially means taking the uh, the software and giving it in either source or binary to somebody else. And when you say someone else, is that within the company or outside of the company? No, no, it's outside of the company. Okay. There, there's interesting issues and 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 debates around like things like um, vendors and and whatnot that that yeah, you need so to be a aware contractor. of. Contractor. So a contractor that is contracted to the company still is within the company. Well, I, I, it, it, that depends on the facts and certain. That's what I mean by there's a debate around that. Is you know there there. That de- that's heavily fact dependent on on different facts and circumstances around you know how closely the vendors tied to the company and that kind of thing. And then network interaction triggers is network traffic inside the company or outside the company. Just want to make it clear it's outside the company. I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, it would be with somebody you know outside the company. Although you you can look. I mean, Google has a public position on this that the the idea of network interaction and vendors inside the company scares them so much that they ban AGPL for that reason. If you look at the the Google uh, Docs page that they they have an overview of why they believe that to be the case. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So I I I put a pin in a few things and I and I want to and I want to try to hit them here. Um so permissive I said, you know, the the idea of you know the attribution obligation being easy um well yeah that's that's kind of true um and you know this is the only latin i I don't like to use latin as a lawyer i think it's a little pretentious but i really like this saying um you know facile dictu to ficile factu which means you know easy to say difficult to do so yeah just provide attribution made a lot of sense in the in you know when programs were smaller um what i'm showing you here is um until recently, the current version of the the notices file for one of Microsoft's projects for VS um, for Visual Studio that ran was manually maintained by a paralegal that ran fifteen hundred pages long, and you know was still growing. It was I'd say essentially a half time job just kind of maintaining this um, you know accurately on a going forward basis, and so. You know, while it's really, e- you know, while it's easy to say, like, you know, just provide attribution, doing it in a structured and, um, you know, thoughtful way is, it can be very difficult. Okay. So that covers our, um, you know, our, our kind of refresher on on open source licensing um, for folks just to kind of get an idea of where the, the pitfalls are and what the what the licenses cover. Let's move into um, a little bit around that derivative work question so that people kind of have an idea of why I think that there isn't a ton of good guidance um, in this space. So uh, again, you know, let's, you know, while we think about this, let's think about that entire stack. I think that's a, an important takeaway. I think you know, something that I'd like to pass on um, is this idea that you really need to kind of look at that full full stack when you're thinking about what you're doing. So let's. I'm going to do a quick technical aside. I know there are a lot of technical people on the call, so I'll try to make this brief. Um, derivative work is often tied in the in the literature and 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 in the um, explanations of licenses to this concept of linking. Um, and sometimes people try to draw a distinction between um, uh, linking in the uh, uh, in the static sense and linking in the dynamic sense. So let's let's just get an idea of like what those are functionally down at the bottom of the stack at a technical, and then try to apply the the kind of legal analysis or as best we can to what that looks like. So uh, what is linking? You have a program that's in green, you have a library that's in orange. Your program wants to use some functionality, let's call it sorting a list, right? So what happens is your program starts at the top and it executes until it says, hey, like, you know, sort the list. And what happens is, the, the compiler, when, when that, that source code is turned into object code, it goes out and it takes from the library code that, that the compiler has access to. And it just literally copies and pastes, or not, well, not literally, but essentially copies and pastes that function for sorting into your program so that your program can execute it 
It executes that function for sorting, returns the sorted list to your program, and your program keeps executing. So it essentially just kind of copies and pastes in from the library into the program. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's that's essentially what the compiler is doing when you're using a library um, statically linked with your program. So what is dynamic linking? Think that, um, the key difference between dynamic and static linking is that in dynamic linking, the, <clears throat> the running of the library function is done during execution of the program. So instead of having the entire, um, that, that function, the functions that you need copied into your program, instead, your program's executing, it wants to sort a list, it calls out to the library. So in the computer, the computer dumps the program from memory, loads the library program up with the with what's um, with the the context for what it's been passed, which is that list that's going to be sorted. That library executes and then returns the list to the program. Um, returns the list to the program, and then the program continues to uh, continues to execute. And so the difference here is that none of the library is copied into the program at all. Um, there, there are kind of some technical, um, uh, there's some technical goodness with either one. For the dynamic linking, you can replace the library very easily without recompiling the program. So it's kind of easy to update, um, you know, programs that are out in the wild on devices and whatnot. Um, with static linking, um, you get some performance enhancements, at least in kind of the C ecosystem, which is uh, what I grew up in and what um, I'm more familiar with than these kind of fancy JavaScript things that a lot of people are doing nowadays. Um, any questions on, on this kind of quick technical aside before I, uh, before I move on to, to the legal uh, pieces? Okay, so the uh, hearing nothing, the, the kind of key difference here is that, that that we should take away into the next piece is static linking, you're actually copying the thing into the program, dynamic linking, you're not. All right, so what is the derivative work of software? Okay, let's look at the statute. What does the statute say? It's a derivative work, is a work based upon one or more pre-existing works such as a translation, musical arrangement, dramatization, fictionalization, motion picture version, sound recording, art reproduction, abridgment, condensation, or any other form in which a work may be recast, transformed, or adapted. So oh, let's continue. Ed editorial revisions, annotations, elaborations, or other modifications which represent an original work of authorship is a derivative work. All of these things have no application to software at all, except through analogy. So there's not a lot of, you know, helpful um, guidance here from from Congress when they added um, software to the statute. They didn't update this definition at all um, to apply to to software. So we're kind of left to figure out, hey, what do courts uh, say about that? Which brings us to the '90s and um, some video game cases, which I think are the most relevant in this space. There, there are other cases that have uh, relevance as well, but I, I think that those are also kind of tangentially, tangentially related um, to the same extent kind of video games are. And I, I view these as the kind of two leading cases as you're considering your analysis. So let's start with Game Genie. For those of you who don't know what Game Genie is, let's have a 30 second refresher. Game over! No way! Because we got Game Genie! We tell you when it's over! With Game Genie, I decide how many lives I get! I use it when I want to live forever! Play to the end! And win! Maybe I want to start on level 15! No problem! It makes cool games like Street Fighter 2! More exciting! Less frustrating! With Game Genie, it ain't over! So we say it's over! Excellent! Game Genie for NES, Super NES, Sega Genesis, and Game Boy! Code so many popular games, each sold separately! So I hope you were able to, to get the sound. Yeah, that's that's a blast from the past. So uh, this was very popular when I was 8 to 10 years old. Um, so I was like right in the sweet spot for, for Game Genie 
um, working. As you can tell, they they, they didn't mind uh, knocking off um, different types of copyright. I mean, that that kind of evokes Phil and uh, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure a little bit too much uh, for my for my taste. I don't even know if it would could, could qualify as a parody or under fair use or anything like that. But uh, they did it anyway. Um, so uh, what Game Genie essentially was. It was a cartridge that you put between the um, the the game cartridge back in the day when you took a video game. You'd take a cartridge and you would put it into the machine, and then you'd turn on like Nintendo or Sega Genesis or anything like that, and that would um, then um, you know then the game would operate. That would load the game into memory and whatnot, and, and off you'd go. Um, game Genie would put some a cartridge in between those two cartridges. And then change the registers that in your uh, in the in the box, so in Nintendo or Sega, in the in the game platform, so that you could have things like extra lives or the ability to jump extra high or you know various other kind of enhancements and cheat codes and that kind of thing. So it was basically like modding the game using a uh, using a a cartridge that would would modify the 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 um, registers inside the Nintendo or, or, or Sega Genesis. So that was an unlicensed um, uh, modding program. Um, Nintendo sued, and I think Sega did as well, uh, Game Genie saying, uh, look, um, you're unlicensed to, to use this on our platform. And what you're doing is creating a derivative work of our licensed games, like Super Mario Brothers, you know, giving, you know, in the, the derivative work was, look, you know, you can jump extra high and, you know, mod the, uh, mod the lives and, and whatnot. And so um, the Ninth Circuit, which is a court of appeals in the United States, so, you know, has some, and, 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 Kind of heavily thought of as a as a copy copyright court because of its uh, proximity to Hollywood, um, says no, that's that's not a derivative work. And one of the uh, rationales behind that decision was no part of Super Mario Brothers, let's say, was copied by the Game Genie um, at all. Um, they were actually just changing the registers on the Nintendo itself. So the fact that you know even though the that when booted up in memory, there was there was a game that essentially was a little bit different than Super Mario Brothers. That game was just ephemeral, and there was no actual copying of Super Mario Brothers into the Game Genie, and therefore the Game Genie couldn't be a derivative work of Super Mario Brothers itself. And um, and and so there was a bright line there for a moment around you know okay, so I didn't copy any of the original. Therefore, I um, I didn't make a derivative work, and so that's the that's the Game Genie case. And so that that what's interesting about this case and the timing is that this is a, around a year after the the GPL was written, and the GPL, you know, the famous copyleft license that extended to the extent of a derivative work. So people would look to this case and say, "Look, bright line rule, dynamic linking okay, static linking not okay." And the reason is because in dynamic linking, you're not copying any of the library into the program. You're just putting them side by side. This looks a lot like the Game Genie case. So there was another case <laughs> um, that comes up next, which is Duke Nukem. Now, uh, I'm going to let Duke Nukem play in the background a little bit while I um, you know, continue to go. It's a first-person shooter game. Um, you run around a map killing bad guys with your pistols or whatever weapons that you pick up. You run around um, in various locations and, and see kind of various things. Um, and so this was a kind of, you know, er, er, you know early in the genre of pers first person shooters, you see a bad guy right there as, uh, as we've kind of stopped running, running through. Um, the, the way that this, uh, or what, led to the dispute that was decided by the Ninth Circuit, you know, six years after the Game Genie case, was that the author of uh, Duke Nukem, which I believe was Microstar, uh, the author of Duke Nukem went out and um, allowed people to write their own levels for Duke Nukem. And they provided a level editor. And the restriction on the level editor said any output of this can only be used for non-commercial 
non-commercial use. So, so the idea was you get basically a bunch of fans building other levels and sharing them on bulletin boards or, you know, on AOL back in 1998 or whatever it was um, to kind of enhance the functionality of the game overall um, and, and kind of generate a, a, a broader user base. So what happened was the defendant in this case, again, I believe it's FormGen, um, went out and scooped up all of, remember, this is the 90s, so like, you know, low bandwidth, et cetera, scooped up all of the level files that they could find, about 500 of them, and burned them onto a CD and then offered that for sale. And um, you know, the Duke Nukem publisher sued and said, hey, uh, you know, you've created derivative work of Duke Nukem when you just uh, send these, ship these levels around. And in a very entertaining um, opinion, the now disgraced Judge Kaczynski um, held no that these level editors were a derivative work of Duke Nukem. And there were a few different reasons for that. But let me just talk a little bit about how those level editors work. No part of Duke Nukem was copied into the level editor at all. The level, the map file was literally just uh, some codes that say like, you know, that, that were interpreted by Duke Nukem to be like body armor, bad guy, gun, wall, um, window, you know, etc. There was nothing that was in the, the level file that was part of the Duke Nukem game. In fact, you could write a different game that could interpret that map editor with different graphics, etc. Right. But nobody had, but you could. And so what Kaczynski said was, and so, you know, the, the defendant in the case said, well, look, you know, in the Game Genie case, some direct copying was required. So therefore, um, you know, we, you know, there, we didn't do any direct copying and therefore it can't be a derivative work. The judge said, no, no, not, not so fast. The, these map files are designed specifically to work with the, um, you know, the Duke Nukem game. And therefore, they, you know, therefore, they're they're not playable with anything else. That's that's by definition kind of the derivative work. And then there's a footnote. It's footnote five in the case that says, well, you know, if there were a bunch of this was kind of a standard thing, and there were a bunch of different first person shooter things that, that could read these map fires, interpret them different ways, we might reach a different conclusion here. Um, the other thing to note is that this is copyright law. So my overarching principle kind of going up to the top of the stack is judges like to punish people who they think are being naughty. And I think that, uh, you know, generally uh, the, the court thought that the, the defendant in this case was being naughty and Game Genie was innovative. And this was just kind of like, you know, profiting on somebody else's stuff. And so there's a very kind of there's a kind of a, an equity or a fairness um, type of flavor to the opinion as well. The, the other point I'd make is that there's there's a there's another line of reasoning, which is you know essentially you're selling a sequel to Duke Nukem, right? Like even though you need the original Duke Nukem game in order to use the the map editors, um, you're just selling a sequel, and a sequel is is in the statute is is essentially being um, you know it, it or, or falls more clearly in the statute as um, as being something subject to the derivative work right, therefore blockable by uh, MicroStar. So so. Right, clear as mud, right? But that's that's what we have, or I think those are the two kind of cases that I'd lean on. Um, there might be some others um, if if forced to litigate this issue, which I hope I never am. Um, so that brings us to back to the Eclipse public license, and let's talk a little bit about like you know now that we have gone and done a deep dive, like you, you know you be the lawyer for a little bit, um, and like, what is a derivative work and what's the extent of copy left? You know, do you believe it's dynamic linking or static linking or both? Um, you know, is it an interesting question um, for you to, to ponder? But um, we talked about the Eclipse public license having these bright lines typically thought to be around kind of jar files. Well, does the Eclipse public license actually have that bright line as it's written? This is Eclipse version version one. It says basically that copyleft extends to changes or additions to the program, but doesn't extend to things that are not derivative works of the program. So in order for um, the copyleft provisions in the Eclipse public license not to reach, um, not to reach, you know, other parts, those parts need to not be derivative works of the program. Which begs the question: What does that mean? 
does that mean static linking? Does that mean dynamic linking? This is typically Java for Eclipse. So, you know, it's typically uh, dynamically linked. Well, you know, what's great about these nonprofit uh, uh, entities that stand up licenses, they often have FAQ. So let's do what Eclipse says that they meant when they said derivative works. They say, well, well, what is linking? Does it does it mean that your program is a derivative work or not? That's the FAQ. And then they say, no, we don't know. It it means whatever it means under U.S. law. Thanks, Eclipse Foundation. That doesn't um, that doesn't help us at all. So they punted. Um, but if you go online to kind of popular resources around licensing, what you'll see is this is from TLDR Legal. What you'll see is that um, it's similar to the GPL, but allows you to link code under the license to proprietary application. That's a very clear statement um, by TLD TLDR Legal. And that green check mark in TLDR Legal, if you click through, it means that a, a, um, it's advertised as meaning that a prominent attorney um, from a very large and, and wealthy law firm has, has signed off on this guidance. So given what we just learned about kind of dynamic linking and derivative works and kind of GPL trying to extend that far, and maybe the Eclipse license potentially extending that far too, like why would somebody at, you know, at a large law firm who's prominent in the field, you know, be comfortable making this kind of green check mark assertion that you can link against this and, and, and even if Eclipse won't do it? And the answer is the top of the, the, top of the stack. The, the, in the Eclipse community, the people who are using the license in Java, they've forever it's meant jar files. If it's a different jar file, it's fine. If it's not, then then you, then you need to release the source. And so, understanding if we're if we're just going to apply the legal and technical to our decision making, we can get trapped in areas that are go against the customs of the people that are, are actually using these shared resource licenses. And so that's something to keep in mind as you're making your calls and we transition to thinking about, you know, what do we, what do we mean? What does it mean to counsel at scale? And, and we're making that transition indeed. Um, any questions on that module before I move on? Okay, so I will. So how do I think about counseling at scale? So let me, let me put my framework up one more time. Again, the goal is to move things from right to left, custom to commodity. On the bottom parts, draw as many bright line rules as you can. On the top, use guideposts or principles. Okay, that's that's really the 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 framework that I use, and, I, and you can use this in any area um, that you're counseling. I'd I'd say you know it, it's broadly applicable to, to law generally. So how do we think about it in the open source space? Okay. It's an iterative process, right? The first thing that you do is you discover kind of like where is your guidance needed, right? You investigate the solution to that. I wouldn't write tooling at that point. I would then take that solution and turn it into a human heavy process, right? That can be just documentation. You know, you could imagine whitelist, blacklist, like, net, like Google, network copyleft, not okay. Right, everything else okay, or you know, okay with you know, provided that you do these things, checklists, that kind of thing, and then you enforce those as after that human process settles down, you have a good idea for what it is. Then you automate it by building tools that reinforce that system. If you do this out of order and you tool first, then you end up having a lot of iteration on the tooling, and that, um, and that. Uh, can hurt um, a, a large organization like Microsoft. Um, one of the things that we went through in, in my practice was that our tooling was um, was changing very rapidly. It moved around from team to team. And we had 150 lawyers responsible for doing kind of our frontline review for, for the exception cases that got thrown that as part of that kind of like discovery investigate process and they would and as it would change the tooling as like a new a new team would take over and say well we could do this much better in this way um educating those 150 lawyers 
to actually, you know, to know why they were looking at what they were looking at was more, was harder than actually changing the tool. So actually getting a clear documented process that people work through is much better than kind of like moving tooling, um, uh, moving tooling around. I think maybe I could give a, give an example here. So at Microsoft, what we do is we, we get right into our developer tools with our, with our open source discovery process. So the, that, that discover, it kind of leads to two things. One is where are you using open source in your organization? Um, in, in a lot of places like NPM, NuGet, the packaged ecosystems, it's very easy to discover um, because you have lock files and that kind of things in your repository that tell you what the, um, uh, what the components are and what their dependencies are um, that you're that you're using in your in your program. So discovering that, cataloging it, um, getting detection around it is critical. Um, and then deciding, you know, what are the things that we are concerned about? Like, what are we going to block on? What are we going to require people to do more on? Is important. So you need to tell people, for example, you need you need to make a notice file. Um, that kind of thing. Um, we've automated that notice file. I'll get to that in a minute. But you know, we you know, you block on things that you know require human attention, and you automate automate the rest. And so then the question is, you know, where are you going to block? We found a bunch of components recently that are under um, that are available on like kind of widely available on NuGet NPM, but that are actually under a commercial license. So they're depend like sub dependencies of things that we're using, but it's under some random commercial license. How do you deal with that? Getting a process with our procurement team, et cetera, to make sure that that when we tell people, hey, you can't use this, that they have a process to go and get the the licenses that they need is extremely important if they want to go and get them. That kind of thing. So you catch it as it comes and you develop a process. A human process first, and then a tool process second. Once that human process settles down, and so the tenants that we use here um, are to get right into the developer tool. It's built into the tool. You get an alert in your CI/CD continuous integration, continuous deployment system um, when you're using open source that we think needs, um, you know, needs attention. Um, we try to keep it really simple. Like, what are the obligations that that you need to pay attention to, um, you know, given the various use cases? And then again, we try to turn that customer bespoke um, into commodity. In the use area, I think it's really helpful to think about, you know, what is it that we're trying to, what do we care about really? And I think the the answer to that is is we care about like like developers are pretty good about like knowing that the things that they're using on their top level dependencies are like are kosher with you know kosher with within kind of uh, Microsoft policies. It's these sub dependencies that they won't even look at. This undiscoverable um, you know non kosher thing living in the pickle jar that you want to that you want to um, think about. So I want to talk a little bit about how we deal with those. And, the, and, and sorry, those, those non-kosher things are basically unexpected copyleft or unexpected proprietary um, components are, are really all that you need to be concerned about um, if you've automated the, um, um, the attribution process, which we have. And I'll, I'll describe that in a minute as well. So um, the, way that, the way that we've been doing this, we've actually stood up an open source uh, project or I guess I guess you could call it probably called clearly defined. It's really it's kind of an open source service that can be mirrored in in various locations. And what clearly defined does is it takes every open source component uh, that we can find, like everything, and and you know Amazon and Google and Microsoft. And this is all through the open source initiative. It all donated compute time to doing this, so we're, we're, it's a massive effort. Harvest all the open source components in all the different places: npm, NuGet. Um, Maven, et cetera. Um, we run open source license tools over them to discover the different licenses that we have. Um, those tools we agree, and as, as a community, those tools are pretty good at identifying 
you know, certain licenses. And if they come back with a, with a high level of accuracy, then we say, okay, that's really the license that we've, we've discovered for the component. If we, if there's something called no assertion, if it comes back without, it says like, Hey, this looks like a license. I don't know what the license is. Um, can someone look at it? If if we or somebody else you know sees that, we will um, look at the license itself and either curate it as an open source license and say like, hey, like we agree as a community, like more than one person needs to agree to make a pull request against the database. What is that? Um, what is that license? We all agree this is what it is, and then we uh, we put that in the database, and then we send some feedback to the project saying like, hey, you know, you're not. We, we're trying to use your software. We think it's under this license, but it's unclear. Could you help us? Um, could you help us figure out what license your project's really under? Because at the end of the day, licenses are just permission. Um, if the author of the project doesn't know what 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 we need to do in order to use the software then then how are we going to know and so that's all about you know how we how we think about that um and and our notice files are actually built off of clearly defined and the license information that's all available publicly um as part of that um uh as part of that database so i invite you to check it out it's clearly defined.io um, there are there's documentation and interfaces to it for those of us who kind of work on in Ospos or in, in tooling organizations, um, so that you can query it and you know it'll return the relevant license information for 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 the list of packages that you send it. So you know this is inside of our component governance system. Um, so you know we have the list of packages. We've auto detected most of them. You know others have been manually input. And we click, you know, notice, configure it. Let's, you know, what are we shipping? Some things have, um, you know, dev dependencies or whatnot. Um, and then you just click download, and you get a notice file on our form, and and everything and everything works together. I just want to flash really quickly. This isn't what Microsoft uses. We we have a combination of proprietary and open source solutions. There's a tooling group through the Open Chain uh, group that is trying to put together. Um, or at least build the interfaces between a bunch of open source tools to think about how you build a kind of fully open source CI CD infrastructure. And the, and the way that this essentially works, and this is, you know, we, we, we have an almost all the way solution there at Microsoft is, you know, you got to discover what you have, right? So you, you know, dependency resolver, like what's in the container, what's in the binaries, um, you got to go get all the source that you need and like analyze what the licenses are. Um, you figure out how your um, program is building those things. Um, and then you, you know, figure out what the policies are for this organization. Um, and then you need to, you know, produce the compliance artifacts, which, you know, right now, um, I think best tooling I've seen can produce notice files. That's what we have. Um, down the road, you, you could imagine situations where the source code is spit out, um, the, the, the source code fulfilling all obligations is spit out along with that license file and archived somewhere for anybody to, to reach. And so that's, that's kind of the holy grail that this kind of cross-company team um, being led by um, a man um, named, out of Siemens um, has been has been working on um, in the open chain community. So I'd like to spend the uh, uh, last five minutes or so talking a little bit about how we think about counseling around contributing and releasing. Um, the first question that I asked, uh, or one of the first questions I asked in the use case is like, what are we defending against? And I think it's really easy to, to kind of grok that for everybody in the use case, right? It's it's unknown obligations creeping in and therefore, you know, us not being able to fill them, fulfill them because they're unknown or, or kind of unwanted. Um, so that's, that's, that's the first question you'd be asking yourself in all of these situations when you're thinking about scale, right? Because it's easy to say no, um, but if you but if you say no without a reason, then you're just being needlessly blocking as a lawyer, and and that's you know something that a lot of lawyers uh, get a lot of flack for, and something that I, you know I try to try to not ha have happen in my practice. So what are you defending against in contributing release? And so I, I think the answer to this question is essentially unwanted leakage of 
patent or copyrights or trade secrets that like we think are super valuable for our team. Okay, great. So let's balance that against a few different things, right? Um, one is kind of the HR thing. A lot of developers want to be able to engage with open source communities in various ways, either part as part of their job or kind of outside their outside their job. So you know that unwanted leakage, like how much are you willing to how much are you willing to block, right? Um, do we care? If someone's like, you know, writing a sorting library, which is very unlikely to have IP, which is kind of like, you know, utilities and that kind of thing, um, programming languages, does it, if your company's not a, you know, compiler company, you know, do you care if your work, um, can you greenfield for your developers compilers? This is harder for Microsoft because we write all the software, all the different types of software and everything or practically everything. Um, but you know, if you're not, then maybe you greenfield a bunch of things. Um, and compiler technology, that's not that exciting anymore. Um, you know, maybe maybe you can consider uh, greenfielding that. Um, and you know, there's a development cost to not contributing back in lots of situations. The cost of forking or maintenance of the code. If there are other people who are interested in the a solution that you uh, you know grown uh, custom uh, custom solution, maybe releasing it. And and collaborating in the open with those folks would would lower your cost development cost to a significant advantage that outweighs the kind of trade secret IP risk that you um, that you're entailing. And uh, I'd say the kind of last like consideration is if you're using a oh and, and there's also a cost of maintaining a fork. So you know if there's a if there's an open source project you really like but you're really concerned about kind of IP around that. What's the what's the what's the engineering cost of maintaining that fork as that as you know you, you make a fork the program progresses continuing integration with that fork can be really difficult and so you know is the cost worth you know what what you're defending against um, um, at the outset and then you know being comfortable with um, you know things like you know community norms around how to contribute. You know, some people have, you know, contributed to license agreements that assign, you know, pat or, or, or sorry, that grant patent rights or, or copyrights in the code um, or, or broad licenses to them, at least. Um, whereas others just say, like, you know, we, we have the ability to put this under an open source license. You know, are, are you comfortable or can you get comfortable with all those different communities? And if you're if you can't get comfortable um and and so many others have you know is that needlessly blocking for for the company and so those are really I, I, you know these are kind of the tenants that i'd that i'd weigh as i'm as i'm thinking about you know contribution and release guides like how do we do it at scale i will say like the small code exception is something that was met with a lot of celebration at microsoft because um, Microsoft, you know, we used to just kind of review every contribution that went anywhere. And so people would just either not follow our policies because they were too onerous, it would take a long time to do a kind of a small bug fix, or, um, or they just wouldn't do it, which isn't what we want either because of, you know, like I said, the cost of maintaining a fork or whatever. So, so, you know, accepting something that's unlikely to have a lot of valuable, you know, value to the company, either as a patent or trade secret, um, because it's, you know, a few lines of code um, from the overall process, it might be something that is is kind of worth considering. And it also kind of unblocks a large amount of the open source engagement that people want to engage in. They want to scratch their own itch. This isn't working properly. Like, let me fix it. Like, I, I need to use this component, but um, you know, but the components, there's a bug, like I need to fix it so that I can, you know, unblock myself to build this, you know, larger thing that I'm working on. Um, you know, giving that level of unblocking is actually quite, um, quite useful for developers. And I think, um, you know, they really appreciate it. Um, questions uh, on this? How do you, how do you communicate the sort of ex the scope of the small code exception to developers? What's, what's small? Yeah, you know, maybe I should have. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, you know, small can be under a certain number of lines is typically what we do. Or and 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 you can do it in in two different ways. You can say like not significant functionality or or and a small number of lines. 
and you know, I think that, you know a lot of developers will will come back to me a bit pedantically saying, "Okay, you know this, uh, you know what is not significant functionality mean?" And I'm like, you know what significant functionality is. <laughs> You know, like I can't tell you what significant functionality means in 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 the particular instance that you're making the contribution, but you know, and they usually do. It's fuzzy, but it, that fuzziness kind of helps, I think. Right. Um, one other thing I'd say is like you know, inside of Microsoft, I, I pointed you at Google's doc site, like the public version. I mean, I think it's docs.opensource.google.com or something like that. Um, if you Google open source docs, Google, you know, we have an internal documentation site. We're thinking about, you know, trying to, to scrub for, pub, for, you know, it's kind of low on the list, but, um, you know, scrub for, you know, to get our policies and, and thought processes out there to the extent that, that we can, and they're not privileged, um, you know, throughout the company. Um, it's really helpful to have a central location if you're going to scale your advice to write down your advice in like checklist form for folks to be able to look at and, and learn from. And so that's something if you're, if you're thinking about doing this inside a company, having a central location for that is critical. Um, and, and it helps answer a lot of, you don't know how, know how many questions I answer by saying, follow the guidance here. And I just send them to the, to our doc site. All right. Well, we're at the end of the hour, so um, I want to, you know, if if you have a couple of minutes and want to answer a couple more questions, then you're welcome to. But I just wanted to go ahead and wrap up and say thank you so much, Justin, for this incredibly informative talk. Um, I'm sure the folks got a lot out of it. Um, we'd love to have you or or others at Microsoft back sometime. Um, and yeah, thanks thanks for uh, donating a little bit of your time to the cause. Yeah, no, no problem at all, and very happy to. And I, I'm, I do have five minutes if folks want to stay around. I'm sorry, I ran right up against time. Um, I, I thought I, I thought I was golden, and then um, I guess the last five minutes got away from me. Any other questions for Justin? For those who have a couple minutes to stick around, I just made an observation in the chat, Aaron, that you know I think Justin's guidance around relying on developers a little bit to assess and attest the the I guess the materiality of code is important because I think the the old adage of sort of or not the old adage but like sort of the default assumption of well how many lines of code doesn't always hold because in a world of you know going back a long ways to Perl but more recently to the to the increasing popularity of functional programming you know a couple lines of Haskell can do what 20 or 30 lines of Java code can do. And so now yes. you have a couple lines of code that in fact can pack a really large algorithmic punch. Um, and in fact could be quite material in terms of what they're doing. Um, so it's that all the more reason you have to use a little bit of discretion rather than just say, well, it's just one line of code where one line of OCAM or Haskell could actually do a ton. Absolutely. And any language that does not have significant white space like Python, you could cram a whole lot into one line. <laughs> I'm sure that a developer has tried to game that system before. <laughs> that's a good way to get fired. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, that's that, that's the point, right? Like you know, but putting it on them and, re and and you know having the attestation, you know, yeah, you know, it's it's not, you know, I, I don't consider this to be materially functional. When if it, in fact it, it clearly was, and that's a you know that's that's an issue. We'll go ahead and unmute the rest so that he is having trouble getting a question in. They have the opportunity. Questions for Justin? And we will we will call it. Thanks a lot, Justin. See you again no soon. problem. Great, great to be here. Thanks, everybody.